Hello, this is Angelica Yingst, and you're listening to Centered, grounded conversations about the metaphysical. So my question today is actually a series of questions, and it's by my dear, dear friend, Natalie Anderson. She asked, my question is, would you be willing to talk a little bit about astrology? My questions kind of fall into three buckets. One, maybe you could give a high-level overview of how you think about and approach astrology, including sun sign versus moon sign versus rising sign. And or maybe a quick description of each sign along with how you characterize them. I suppose this could be a full podcast in its own right or maybe 12 of them. Uh, Three and or how do you incorporate astrology into your readings in your life? So, yeah, I can definitely talk about astrology a bit. I'm not an astrologer. I don't map things out, you know, but I am developing um, kind of a, a... understanding and I've developed an understanding of astrology and how I've broken it down. So maybe that will help because I'm not an astrologer and I don't get too high level. So um, the first question was, could you give a high level overview of how you think about and approach astrology, including sun sign, moon sign, rising sun, etc. Okay, so basically astrology is the snapshot of the sky the moment you were born. So it's said to be like the blueprint of your life, kind of the map Um, if you will, of what you can or may experience in life, what might make you tick, what um, would sort of come up as your life lessons, your issues that you would be dealing with. So most people know their sun sign, and that's because the sun sign is something that we all know by looking at your horoscope, right? So your sun sign is the constellation that the sun was in when you were born. Okay. So basically when you talk about, um, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, you're talking about constellations. Okay. And so the sun changes signs every month. So most people are able to sort of casually know their sun sign. And the sun is of course only one aspect of your personal astrology. So each planet is in every chart. And I think it's important to say that all of this is really neutral. There isn't necessarily a good position or a bad position. There could be challenging aspects or easier aspects, but the idea here is that these are lessons. These are the things we are going to be dealing with. Okay. So, you know, we can kind of say, oh, is it challenging? You might say, yes, but that's also my, the spiritual growth, right? If everything's easy, we don't really get pushed to spiritual growth. So, just to confuse things a little bit, um, and that's the thing with learning astrology, it can get kind of confusing, um, but there are things that astrologers pay attention to. So they play, pay attention to the planets, they pay attention to the signs, they pay attention to the houses, and they pay attention to the aspects. So the planets are like the who in your astrology story. Uh, the signs are the how how that who is going to get expressed. The houses are where, so where it'll get expressed in your life. And the aspects are the relationships between these things with other things, okay, and with each other. So the planets, let's start there. So to ancient astrologers, the planets represented the will of the gods, okay, and the direct influence upon human affairs. So to modern astrologers, they kind of talk about the planets as being our basic drives, our basic urges, and they come from the subconscious. Um, They also are our energy flow regulators, so they kind of represent where energy is going to go. And then they express themselves with different qualities in the 12 signs of the zodiac and in the 12 houses. So the planets are related to each other in the form of aspects, okay? So the patterns that the planets make in the sky reflect the ebb and flow of basic human impulses. So, you know, one of the things that is so fascinating to me about Greek mythology and ancient Greek um, stories is this idea that, like, the gods each had a personality. They each had a, 
a thing they focused on, you know, that was their thing. And they had very human, passionate, emotion, emotion filled responses to things. And so this is kind of what drives what we're talking about in astrology because the planets were named after the gods. Okay, so let's talk about that. So when I said the planets are the who of our charts, they're like the different characters in the play of our lives. Okay, so the traditional planets have roles that mirror their Roman mythology roles, which is also Greek mythology. Okay, because the Romans kind of are the ones that map the sky, right? So Mercury is the planet that moves the fastest through the sky. It has the, you know, we see it most often. It's the messenger. In Greek mythology, Mercury's is Hermes. And her and Mercury flew fast to deliver messages for the gods and goddesses. And he could go anywhere. Okay. So that's why, you know, Mercury goes retrograde three times a year because it moves fast around. You know, whereas we'll see other retrogrades that happen like once every 18 years or once every year or something like that. That's because of their orbit, right, and our relationship to it. Uh, Venus or Aphrodite is the lover, okay? So Venus, the planet, is the one that rules love, you know, and, and beauty and um, pr- how we present ourselves. Mars or Aries in Greek mythology is the warrior, Jupiter or Zeus, Zeus and Jupiter are the same, is the wise sage, the, the, the biggest god, right? Saturn or Kronos, that's Zeus's father, Kronos, and he's the taskmaster or the ruler. So he's the one that sets ways of being. And if you don't know the story of Kronos and the Titans, Kronos had, you know, babies and then ate them because He overthrew his father, and he didn't want his children to overthrow him. So, you know, Zeus was hidden as a baby, so Kronos couldn't eat him, okay? So think about that in relation to rulers, you know? Like the rules, they're so strong, and that ruler doesn't want to be upturned, he doesn't want things to change, that he would eat his own children, okay? Okay? Uranus or Uranus is the revolutionary. And on this side note, Uranus is the only one that isn't the Roman name because Uranus or Uranus is named after the Greek god of the sky. And according to the myth, he was the father of Saturn and the grandfather of Jupiter. Okay, so this is the father of Saturn or Kronos, the one that eats all his children. And what he did was cut his father's you-know-what off, his penis, threw it into the sky. So that's how he becomes god of the sky. Um, And according to the myth, like, he, you know, ruled the sky because his, you know, penis was there. Anyway, um, Neptune or Poseidon, the god of the sea, is the dreamer, the one in the emotions, Pluto or Hades, the god of the underworld, is the transformer. So the history of astrology obviously dates back a really long time, more than 4,000 years, to the great civilizations of the world. And we see the relationship with the gods and the constellations and astrology. You know, it happens in many cultures. It's not just one Western tradition. Um, The planets in Hindu astrology are known as the Navgar. Navagra, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and that means literally nine planets in um, Sanskrit and with the addition of two shadow bodies. In Chinese astrology, the planets are associated with life forces or the yin and yang. So each has an element, each has a, um, you know, feminine or masculine, and they play a really important role in feng shui, but they're not necessarily read the same way we read astrology. So um, the societies used, these societies, I should say, the great civilizations, used constellations to predict the change of seasons, climatic events. And we know now because we understand that they're orbiting around the sun that we would see certain ones, you know, at certain times of the year. So that's how they would do that. So constellations were part of their religious worldview. 
And the names of the constellations of the Western Zodiac actually come from the 12 Olympian gods of Greek mythology. So each god is a protector of their own sign, and each sign denotes a different personality type with its own strengths and weaknesses. So the astrological signs retain the names of actually the Greek gods and refer to um, one of the 12 specific constellations of the zodiac that the sun passes through. So a person's particular sign of the zodiac is the one that the sun was in when they were born. So each sign is influenced by a planet or star. And these bear the names in um, Greek mythology, Roman mythology. So they're all, all the kind of the together, right? Um, so um, I can go through them. Um, and I kind of already did do a lot of them. So the sun is Helios or Apollo. The Roman deity is Sol. And it's the God, he's the god of prophecy and solar incarnation. So Helios really just means the sun. The moon is um, Luna or Diana in Roman. In Greek, it's Selene or Artemis. And this is the god of hunting and lunar incarnation and cycles. Okay. Um, Mercury is Hermes and he's the god of messengers, travel and commerce. So that's why Mercury rules those things, right? Venus is, is Venus or Aphrodite. And she's the god of romance and lust. And Venus just means love or lust, you know, uh, depending on your point of view. Mars is Aries, and that's the god of war. Jupiter is um, Zeus. Um, in, that, in Roman, it's Jupiter, but he is the king and the father of the Olympian gods. So Jupiter literally means jovial king, or sometimes people interpret it as the father of thunder. Um, Saturn is Kronos, and he's the god of uh, agriculture, the leader of the rulers of the Titans, and he his name means the god of seeds or the father of the harvest. Uranus or Oranos in the Greek is the god of the sky, uh, the father of Saturn, grandfather of Jupiter. He is just like the sky god, the sky daddy, if you will. Uh, Neptune is Poseidon. He's the god of the sea, and he and and so he he ruled you know all the waters. Um, Pluto is Hades, and he's a god of the underworld and death. Hades literally means the unseen, whereas Pluto means wealth. So you can see how those come together. Okay, so the signs then are the how of the zodiac, meaning the way the sign functions in the world. So all the signs have an element, and so there's four elements, the fire, earth, air, and water. And they each have a quality. Okay, so they're either cardinal, fixed, or mutable. And this is how I think about all of them. This is the easy way for me to remember what every sign's qualities are, okay? So if you have a zodiac sign, three are in each element, right? And four are in each quality, meaning, um, you know, each element has like each five, there's three fire signs, three earth signs, three air signs and three water signs, whereas there's four cardinal signs because it's one from each element, four fixed, one from each element, okay? So you can like learn a lot by just knowing whether they are in, you know, they are uh, fire, earth, air, water, and then secondly, if they're cardinal, fixed, or mutable, okay? So when we start the zodiac, we start in Aries because that starts vernal equinox, and that's the old new year. I mean, that used to kick off the agrarian calendar, right? The beginning of spring where everything is starting to bloom. So the zodiac signs are often presented in a circle because it's a cycle. And the circle is, you know, representing the year. So the signs repeat in elements. So it goes fire, earth, air, and water. And then fire, earth, air, and water, fire, earth, air, and water. So that's how it goes the whole time. All right. So your signs then are um, cardinal. Now, cardinal signs kick off the season. So they kick off the, you know, Aries is the first sign of the zodiac. It kicks off spring. It starts at vernal equinox. That's the beginning of spring. Okay. So cardinal zodiac signs, they start a season. And because of that, they're considered leaders. Okay. So they lead their season right? They started all off. 
So the fixed zodiac signs then are the ones that come in the middle of their season. They're right at that pinnacle. And they are said to embody each season fully. Okay. So they're stable. They're grounded. They're stubborn. <laughs> they, they basically fully realize the element that they are. Mutable zodiac signs. And these are the ones that often get like the bad rap in, in astrology. Um, they conclude each season. So they help us transition. So mutable signs really cha are changeable, you know, they, and you know this because, you know, when things have to transition, you need to be flexible. You need to kind of kick it off, right? You need to not kick it off, but end it, you know, kind of transition one season into the next. So you can think of it like this. Cardinal signs initiate, fixed signs harness, and mutable signs disperse. Okay, so if we start, let's just talk about all the cardinal signs. The cardinal zodiac signs are Aries, Cancer, um, Libra, and Capricorn. So these zodiac signs kick off the season. Aries begins spring, Cancer begins summer, Libra launches autumn, and Capricorn announces spring. And just as they sound the alarm that this new period has arrived, these are our leaders of the Zodiac. They're the ones that are the doers. They're unafraid to initiate new things and new cycles, whether it's professionally, personally, socially, or intellectually. They have an enthusiasm about new projects. So they're really good at rallying people, starting a journey. And so they have a lot of leadership qualities. Their ambition and ideas are really important to them. They're their shadow aspect is they are not always great at following through. They lack that kind of conclusion energy that is often needed. Fixed zodiac signs are Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius, the fixed ones. These are the ones in the middle of the season. So they follow the cardinal signs. So, and they are said to embody the entire season. So Taurus strengthens spring. Leo radiates summer. Scorpio fuels autumn, especially that release part. And Aquarius embraces winter. Okay. So we can see the fixed signs are kind of the purest embodiment of their season. And as we appreciate the beauty of the time of year, they're like centered within it. So we've gotten used to it and we recognize we're at the height of the seasonal period. So those fixed signs are the powerhouses that have the endurance to take an idea and really take it to the end point, right? They have stamina to see, through, see, see things through. They're focused. They achieve. So to them, failure isn't really an option. They often possess a tremendous amount of confidence and self-belief. So they have patience, worth, work ethic, effort. And these people are often really loyal and trustworthy because they're fixed. They're grounded. They're rooted in their beliefs and devotion. The problem area for these people is the stubbornness. They don't like change. They have a difficult time handling transitions. They like things that are easy because, not easy, but they like things that they know what to expect. Because they put so much heart and soul into it, they don't really want things to shift. Now, mutable zodiac signs are Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius, and Pisces. And these zodiac signs complete a seasonal cycle. So they help transition one season into the next. So Gemini kind of ties up spring and moves us into summer. Virgo shifts us out of summer and into autumn. Sagittarius releases autumn and moves into winter. And Pisces concludes winter. And you can kind of see that they have aspects of both of their signs. So during these periods, we reflect on what we experienced and learned in the past period. But we also look onward. Like we look to the future, what's happening next? And we're preparing for transition. And we realize, okay, it's time to move on. So these cycles are the harvesters of their season. So they have a really great ability to be flexible, adaptable, where other signs don't. And they recognize that change is inevitable. So it's better to kind of go with the flow than fight it. And they often embody or bring in part of the season that they're going into. Okay. So the people um, that are in mutable signs are really good at multitasking. They're really good at moving between different tasks. They're really good at 
heightened awareness and intuition because they sort of move in to the next phase when they have to and they stay in the old phase when they need to. But freedom is really important in mutable signs. They need to explore the options. And because they're multi-talented, they tend to excel in different arenas. And because of that, they're always paying attention to many things at once. So their difficult aspects or their shadow aspects is they're scattered. Their attention isn't on one thing. This lack of complete focus is the thing that often gets them to be like considered airy or, you know, spacey or whatever. But really what they're doing is they're just able to shift and they're able to see more than one point of view. That's important to kind of understand about them is that they're, they're studiers, you know, they're studiers of, of people and they can go with the flow. That's why, you know, you'll hear like Gemini um, is really battered in the uh, astrology world as being two-faced. Gemini is the, you know, Janus is like the twins, right? The two-faced. They go, they say one thing to one person, another thing to another person. It's not, it's not malicious generally. What it really is, is that when they're with one person, they can really see their side of, of things and the next person they can see their side of things. That's their superpower. Okay. So when you think of those aspects, it's really important. Then you're going to apply it to the sign. So the fire sign, or the, the element, sorry, and then the, the sign, right? The fire signs are Aries, Leo, and Sag, Sagittarius. Earth signs are Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn. Air signs are Gemini, Libra, and Aquarius. And water signs are Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces. So then their quality, when you bring that in, is, you know, cardinal, fixed, or mutable. So you kind of can see that even if you don't know or haven't memorized everything about every sign, that you could put those two things together and guess what their attributes would be. So if I don't know anything about Capricorn, and I'd say, okay, Capricorn, I know is a cardinal sign, meaning it kicks off the season, and it's an earth sign, I can put together the concerns of Capricorn. Capricorns like to deal with solid things since the earth is solid and hard. So money, family, home, career, grounding, stability. Cardinal signs kick off the season. So Capricorns are leaders. They come up with ideas. They're independent. They often lack follow through. They need teams behind them. Um, but they can be direct and focused and appear to be a leader and often will step on toes of people that are, you know, the actual leaders because they tend to be great leaders. So if I don't know what Capricorn means, I would say they're focused on work. They're very driven. They make good bosses, but they can be really lousy at follow through and tact. Okay. And I could say they probably are prone to financial stuff, workaholism. They want to be rich, you know, those kind of things. So as a boss and an owner, they're great. You know, as a friend, I don't know, you get to decide. Um, Whereas I know Leo is a fixed sign and it's a fixed fire sign. So they embody, Leos embody the whole of the summer. So they're very solar, okay? So they're creative, self-assured. They're very confident. Many people will interpret that as braggy or arrogant. Why would I say that? Because fixed signs are uh, confident. And when you're sunshiny, that means you're extroverted. You go outward. You project that out, okay? So they aren't interested in moving necessarily, but fire is very active. So they have a very strong belief in themselves and creative energy. They would be really good front people for a project. They're the ones that can communicate well. They know what they're supposed to say. They're not afraid to tell you why something is good, why their idea is good, why they're good, you know. So that's really great. They probably are not great team players, but they're really good if you put them as the talent, quote unquote, the talent, the people out there. A mutable sign, like a mutable air sign, the one that comes at the end of the season is Gemini. And that would be someone I'd know is mutable. So they're interested in um, change and they change their mind a lot because an air sign is associated with thoughts, ideas, the upper chakras. So they're going to be hyper communicative. They probably talk a lot. They probably change their mind a lot. They can probably get caught in analysis paralysis because of the amount of information they bring in, trying to take in every thought, trying to take in every opinion. 
and they often shift. So one day they believe one thing and the next day they believe something and they might seem like they're all over the place, but they're really interested in hearing all sides of a debate so they can make a strong decision. Now, you know, kind of you can apply that to all of them and I'm not going to go through every single one right now, but just understanding like you, if you know the quality, if you know the quality and you know the element, you are doing really well. You know, you can kind of figure it out. Okay. So the houses are the where of your chart. And this is what really like people start tuning out when you talk about houses, but houses are the place where the planets are located. So if the planets are actors and the signs are their style, then the houses are the sets that their story can be played out in. And the houses are like sections of the sky as we see it from earth. And remember this astrology is earth centered. Okay. It's looking at the sky on your, from your point of view. So, um, that's why when you're asked, if somebody says like, what time were you born? Where were you born? They're trying to figure out what did you, what would have you seen in the sky at that time? Okay. So the houses are kind of like the different ways to kind of think about like what is going to be affected by where it is in the sky. Okay. So there's a lot of ways to calculate houses. And I honestly like don't quite understand them. They're different. They call them systems of astrology. The oldest one um, is a house division called whole sign. And it really tends to be the preferred method of determining houses. Um, well, it, it had been for a thousand years. Now people have changed things up, but the whole sign takes the entire span of the zodiac sign that appears on the ascendant at the time of a person's birth as the first house. The ascendant is the exact degree of the zodiac that was rising over the eastern horizon. So that means it's kind of like the sun rising over the eastern horizon at the moment you took your first breath. And so this changes quite a bit. And um, the ascendant is very, very personal to you. It's your personal point in your chart because the degree of the zodiac changes every few minutes. So it's different. Like even with twins, their ascendants can be different. So um, the ascendant point is always in a sign and it's always, it tends to be referred to as your rising sign. Okay. So um, if your ascendant is in, you know, Capricorn, it's you having a Capricorn rising. So um, basically this is your motivation for being here. Okay, this is what gets you out of bed, blah, 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 blah. Um, so the ascendant speaks to what we want to be known for. Okay, so I'll talk about this a little more, um, but just wanted to kind of give you that overview. Um, so I was talking about the whole house. Um, so the whole, whole, whole sign, sorry, the whole sign takes the ascendant and puts that in your first house. Okay. And then every other sign moves accordingly. So in your second house, so let's say you're, let, let's start with the beginning. Okay, we're going to do Aries. Aries is your ascendant. That means it's in your first house if you're doing the whole sign, which is the sign I use. Um, and then, or the, the system I use. The following sign, Taurus, is in your second house then. And then each house goes on from there and all the houses have equal size in the whole sign system. And it is probably an easier brain to you uh, system to use as when, you know, I started reading about the others. I'm like, this is so confusing. I don't understand. Um, but like the other house systems you might see are, uh, plus placidus cock, C O K O C H, uh, campanus, the Regio Montanus, equal, equal velo, whole signs, the Meridian houses, Prophery, Prophery, Porphyry, I think, Algabitius. You can see I'm most comfortable with whole sign. I don't even say these words out loud. If you use like the CoStar app, for example, that's Porphyry. So if you use one app and then you read like another astrologer say you look at co-star and then you like read Channy nicholas she's using a whole other system so you might want to 
look at your sign based on what the astrologer that you're interested in is saying. So the houses are this. There's 12 houses. And the first house, obviously, is your ascendant, your rising sign. So, um, you know, the first house is yourself, your body, your appearance, your vitality. What gets you going? And this is part of the reason it was the whole, the whole sign system uses this because the first house is all about beginnings. It determines the origin of the self and identity. This is all about your outward appearance, your new endeavors, the zodiac sign that rules the cusp of the first house is known as the rising sign. So that's why we're putting that first house in um, with your ascendant. And then again, it's like how you present yourself to the world, the first impressions that you make, blah, 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 blah. Second house is assets, resources, and livelihoods. This is how you make money in the world. It's also your in environment. It's a very physical, material realm. Um, and the second house is associated with like values, self-esteem, self-worth, income, and how we feel at home in our bodies and our environment. So the third house then is communication, daily life, siblings, extended family. And this rules all aspects of communication, like thinking, talking, your online persona. This is where um, tech stuff is ruled, um, like media, electronic devices, etc. cetera. Um, this is also your um, communities and neighborhoods, your daily life, okay? And so um, this is how we articulate our ideas in the world. The fourth house is of parents, home, and foundation. So this is the place of your roots, okay? This is a foundation of the chart. So situated, it's situated like at the bottom of the wheel, and its topics include really home, security, your parents, your, your lineage, your ancestors, and also your children and how you feel safe, how you nurture others, how you approach self-care. That's all dictated here. Your fifth house is children, creative expression, sex, and pleasure. So the fifth house is about all things fertile, okay? So how we, again, are, do art, expression, creative expression, little, literal creation of children. Um, this is, you know, a place that governs attention and play and romance and arts and all of those things. The sixth house is about work and health. So um, sixth house topics are organization, your daily routines, fitness, self-care, uh, natural living, being of service to others, diet and exercise. So you begin to see how all these topics kind of build on each other and the themes are outward. They start very personal with the first house and then they move to other people. The seventh house is your... Uh, house of committed partnerships. And this is directly across from the first house of identity. So it's all about relationships and other people and what we come in contact with. And here is where we make business and personal partnerships, contracts, marriages, business exchanges. It's where we team up with others and get to know ourselves through those interactions, through give and take. So it's a balance of forces in the seventh house. The eighth house is death mental health, and other people's resources. This is one of those mysterious areas of, the ha of your chart, and it has to do with the fact that there's transformation via the birth, death, rebirth cycle. Um, sex is here, deep bonding, other people's money and energy. So the eighth house is all about looking into the depth, sorting through energy and resources and getting to know yourself on a really deep level. It's a merging time. So the ninth house is... Travel, education, publishing, religion, astrology, philosophy. So the ninth house is connected to expansive thinking and growth of all kinds. So that's um, higher learning or education, philosophy, your religion, your spiritual beliefs, your belief systems. This can also be where you're sharing um, your writing and what you believe in, your moral and ethics. And um, so this is across from the third house. Um, which is all about knowledge and information. So, and then this one's about wisdom and intuition and all of that. So your 10th house is career and public roles. And the 10th house is very top of the chart and it's visible. Um, it's the most visible area of the Zodiac. So this is about like our status and our leadership. It's about 
honors and achievement and fame and public reputation. And it's also about authority figures like father and fatherhood and those kind of things. Um, so this um, often, you know, the, the ruling sign in the 10th house is also called midheaven. And so it can give you an idea of your career path. Now, your 11th house is community, friends, patrons, if you do that, and good fortune. So the 11th house governs all things related to big groups of people, uh, community, your work, uh, your work friends, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's associated with the future and our hopes and ideals. So friendship, network, teams, collectives, this is all that part of the sky. Um, and additionally, like a lot of things that we associate with um, Aquarius is often here. So it's originality and eccentricity and unexpected happenings and things like that. So this is really about envisioning the future. So sci-fi is here, rebellion, um, all things future oriented, astronomy, all that is all here. The 12th house is the hidden life. Uh, so your secrets, your sorrow, your loss, and this is the final realm and probably you guessed it. It's sort of the old age part of the houses. It's linked with the subconscious and imagination. And it really can reveal information about the afterlife and dream spaces. And it's one of the more hidden aspects of your chart. Um, and it's kept kind of separate. So, um, so yeah, those are the houses. Now, aspects are pretty confusing. Um, but I'm going to kind of talk about them in a really brief overview. There are five basic major aspects in astrology, and you've probably heard them, or if you've read anything about astrology, you'll hear um, these words. Okay, so their conjunctions is number one, sextiles, squares, trines, and opposition. And an aspect represents the relationship between two planets' position relative to each other. So the sun will conjunct, conjunct Venus. So different aspects, um, let's kind of talk about them. So sextiles are planets two signs away from each other. Okay, that's a sextile. A trine is planets four signs away from each other in the same element. Okay, the aspects are considered gifts and then bestow gifts, blessings, protection. So a square is when the planets are three signs away. An opposition is when they're six signs away. So if you're looking at it in a circle, as most astrology, you know, charts are going to be given to you, anything that's directly opposite is called the opposition, right? These are the challenges. Um, so conjunctions occur when the planet is in the same side as another planet. So they blend their energy. So astrologer and author of Queer Cosmos, Colin Bedell, explains each relationship of an aspect talks to a particular theme, some that feel a little more tension, which can provide opportunity for growth, and then other aspects that can provide a little more ease, which offer complementing energy, resting energy, safe energy. So we can identify the aspects in our own charts, but on a daily basis, the planets in the sky are always forming aspects affecting the energy of the day. So, you know, you'll hear me say, oh, but, you know, the sun is a uh, conjunct uh, Venus. So it's a, a Venus Kazemi, you know, that's what that means. Um, so when we identify these aspects, then we can think about like astrology, astrological compatibility and stuff like that. Okay. So the benefit of understanding aspects, even just a little, is that you are able to have compassion for your squares, your oppositions, your conjunctions, and the impact they have on our lives. So with knowledge, you can make a little bit of peace, okay? Awareness allows you to highlight strengths and work through your weaknesses. And that is a quote from astrologer Casey Budd, okay? So quick recap. Planets are the characters of your chart. Signs denote the style and uh, of what they wear, the style and costume of what they wear. Houses will tell you where that planet is living out their drama and telling their story. And then aspects will tell you which planets are challenging you or which are bringing blessings to you or working harmonious with you. So 
Natalie's question maybe give a high level overview of how you think about and approach astrology uh, included, she said, the sun sign versus moon sign versus rising sign. So, you know, what we went over in the first half hour, 40 minutes of this is the planets, the signs, the houses, and the aspects. So the planets, again, are the who in astrology, the signs are the how, the houses are the where, and the aspects are the relationships between all of those things, okay? So what does it mean when uh, Natalie asks, what's the sun sign versus the moon sign versus the rising sign? So a lot of people call these the big three, and that's basically shorthand right now in our community for the sun, the moon, and the rising, or the ascendant. So ascendant and rising are basically synonyms in astrology, okay? The sun sign basically represents your ego and your motivations. Um, the moon kind of governs our emotional side, you know, the, the stuff we keep under wraps, okay? And then the ascendant is the energy that we're projecting out into the world. And this is why, you know, you can have two uh, people of the same sign, two Aries. And for example, my I have two kids that are Aries. They're born the same week. So I have an Aries with a Libra rising and an Aries with an Aries rising. So my Aries with an Aries rising has more of that competitive, fiery, uh, independent sense. Whereas my... Aries child with a Libra rising is about, is relational. She's looking for relations. Is she always the boss? Yes. Yeah, she still is, but it, it, it comes a little differently. So understanding your sun, your moon and ascendant is kind of showing you like a more complete uh, picture of your personality. So just basically knowing your sun sign is just one aspect, but the natal chart, the whole placement, your astrological chart will tell you more it's more like a thumbprint instead of just a picture of a thumb. Does that make sense? So even like identical twins will have different charts, okay? Because my sister and I have very, very similar charts. But where we are, like some of the houses are different. Some of our little little parts are. And that really makes up the personality, okay? So um, the sun sign changes every 30 days. And we know that because it's like, you know, in the middle of the month or whatever, and astrologically, this is our ego, our pride. It's our overall attitude, our core values. So the sun sign is a factor of just like figuring out your personality. Whereas the moon moves through signs every 2.5 days, right? Because it's going around the earth. So moon signs represent a part of ourselves we can't express outwardly often. It's usually our soul parts, you know, the the... The memories, our idea of comfort, our emotions, our trauma, our maternal relationships, our fertility, you know, the moon is kind of showing you an overall vision of that, okay? And because it changes 2.5 days, you know, that's why you have like different ways of dealing with emotions or shadow stuff, okay? The rising sign or the ascendant gets its name because it is the zodiac sign that's rising on the eastern horizon at the moment of birth. And I kind of mentioned this earlier, but rising signs change every two hours, right? So that's why you can have twins who have different rising signs, depending on, you know, when that two hours comes, you know. So the ascendant is the energy that we're like projecting out into the world, the vibe people pick up on. Um, what they notice about us, what, um, how we carry ourselves, how we process information, how we connect with others. So for me, for example, I am a Capricorn, Sun, Taurus, Moon, and Gemini Ascendant. So my Ascendant is very communicative, hyper-communicative, very curious. My mind's going a mile a minute. Capricorn is an Earth sign. It's a cardinal Earth sign. That's leadership. Moon sign is Taurus. That's a fixed earth sign. Okay. So my Taurus moon is what keeps my emotions like under wraps all the time. You know, I'm always trying to find comfort emotionally. So I often I'm not good at sharing. So each sign has different ways of acting in the world. And I can kind of go through uh, what each sign does in each of those places. 
but I think I should first talk about each sign and then maybe I'll wrap that in together. Okay, so now Natalie asks, uh, maybe a quick description of each sign along with how you categorize them. I suppose this could be a full podcast. This is definitely like a double episode or something. Um, but okay, we can look at a sign's ruling planet, its element, and the quality, right? Where where is it a cardinal? Is it a um, fixed or is it a mutable? Um, for some reason, those just don't like fly off my tongue, <laughs> um, the category, right? So a lot of astrologers will categorize like certain signs as being masculine and other signs as being feminine. Um, so for example, fire and air, masculine, water and earth, feminine. Um, and I think that that, you know, probably is helpful in some ways and also limits in other ways. And part of the ways that it limits is that gender is very fluid and to kind of talk about like, oh, masculine signs are getting things done and water earth signs are receptive, you know. And so that can be really difficult, right, to kind of talk about because it definitely sets up the paradigm of like uh, the feminine being not, you know, uh, more shadowy or bad and male being good or, you know, active or something like that. And I think you know, when we use masculine and feminine, we kind of can get really general generalizationized, you know, like claiming that Capricorns are feminine, you know, because they're earth signs. It really isn't what Capricorns do. Like Capricorns are those signs that are cardinal, you know, they're, they're starters, they're leaders, they're all those things. So I think, you know, thinking more about the element would be more helpful. Okay. So, the fire signs are Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. And what that means is that basically their, their defining characteristic is fiery, passionate, energetic, enthusiastic, and bold. Okay? They're creative. Fire is active. It changes things. It trans, transmutes things. It changes it. It's alchemy. Right? Earth signs are Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn. They're grounded, earthy hardworking, practical, pragmatic, not boring, even though that's what it sounds like. Um, air signs, Gemini, Libra, and Aquarius are like the intellectual thinkers, the talkers, they're logical, they are head focused, okay? But they face people, they're very talkative. So, you know, we think of that in tarot as being like the sign of the swords and like the king of swords just faces you straight on, you know, and that's kind of how air signs lead okay water signs are cancer scorpio and pisces and they are the most uh intuitive and emotional signs so they're the ones that are psychic they're in touch with their emotions subconscious they can be very empathetic and and flexible you know they go with the flow now the modes we talked about with cardinal fixed and mutable and that's very helpful so when we talk about the signs we're going to start at aries which is march 21st to april 19th Okay, that's their sun time. The symbol is the ram. The archetype is the warrior. So you can kind of think of it in terms of archetypes too. And it is a cardinal fire sign. Its ruler is Mars. So it's the god of action, war, and passion. Okay, so a lot of people call Aries the babies of the zodiac, but in the same token, we don't want to dismiss the fact that they have a lot of wisdom. And the wisdom is this bravery and fearlessness they have um and they can wrestle with fear and cur courage you know a lot of aries do things that people think are courageous but really they're afraid so they just change things you know what i mean so they can be wrestling with that in their own way so you know aries is concerned with the self not in a selfish way but in a way that is that they're focused on getting their needs met. They're direct and passionate and headstrong. And so um, they're associated again with the planet Mars. And so the Greek myth with Aries is Jason and the Argonauts. So Jason has a reputation for being fiery, independent, impulsive, and active. Okay. So when the Aries, when Aries is your son, you are ruled by action. Okay. And 
it can be someone who faces fears, who's competitive, who blows past any of that fear, okay? The moon in Aries is known to be emotionally responsive and impulsive. So they tend to lead with passion and lust over logic and reason, okay? And Aries risings are known to be the ones that get things done. They don't like let things stand in the way of them achieving whatever goals they've set for themselves, okay? Now, Taurus is April 20th to May 20th. We are in the Taurus sun right now and only for a couple more days, but their symbol is the bull. The archetype is the sensualist. Don't like that word too much, but that makes a lot of sense. There are people associated with how things feel. And they're ruled by Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. They're a fixed earth sign. So this is one of the most grounded signs. And the reason they're called the sensualists is because they really enjoy earthly pleasures. They're fixed in the earth, right? So they usually aren't too extravagant or anything because they are very grounded. So Taurus likes good food, good drink, good, like good textures, luxurious experiences, even if it's just like being on the couch and watching TV or watching Netflix, they want like a good show and a really comfy blanket and everything is soft and lovely. So they really do appreciate the good things. Okay. They're very good business people. They're very hardworking. They tend to be a little bit like my way or the highway. Um, and they can be really slow to get started, but they are really good at getting things done and being dependable. Um, and they you know, are kind of marked by the fact that Venus is their ruler. So Aphrodite is their ruler and she walks the way of beauty, the beauty way. So all of that stuff is really stabilizing and grounding. All right. So if you have the Taurus sun, you're drawn to like a creative, indulgent life. Okay. And so that's, that's wonderful. They tend to be really loyal and stubborn and all of those wonderful things that make really good friends, actually. <laughs> um, the moon in Taurus or Taurus moon means that they are also pleasure seeking. That's my, that's my moon. Um, they seek out emotional security, those kind of things. The rising, a Taurus rising exudes a lot of sophistication, a lot of grace. Tauruses have beautiful voices usually, and they usually have like a really nice way of handling things. And again, if you challenge this, you know, they can get really stubborn. So um, Gemini is our next sign. This is the symbol is the twins. They go from May 21st to June 20th. The archetype is the communicator and they are a mutable air sign. Their ruler is Mercury. So while they're kind of quick thinking and quick witted, they tend to be the socialites of, I shouldn't say socialites, but social extroverts of the Zodiac. They're able to adapt to a lot of people, a lot of situations. So they're enthusiastic, they're flexible, they're easygoing, but they always are eager to have like curiosity, chatty, they're amicable. They're, they're really eager to have those conversations that like get them thinking about things. So they're they're very much an entertainer. They also can be totally flaky and airheads, you know, and I don't mean that in an off, an, a mean way or anything, but they're just like all over the place. You know, they're a little indecisive. They're changeable. Okay. Again, the reputation for them being two faced is because they're represented by the myth of Castor and Pollux who represent duality, inner unfolding. Okay. The antagonism of body and soul. And, you know, when Mercury is the messenger, Geminis have a reputation for gossiping, for being hyper communicative, but also curious, smart, and intellectual. So Gemini's sons are very chatty and talkative, and they pride themselves on being like up on the latest news and gossip. Okay. So they're the ones that like can see things from a number of pers perspectives. Whereas the Gemini moon is ruled by Mercury. They will discuss and process their feelings a lot, okay? And they have to talk about it out loud to kind of get a perspective. Whereas Gemini risings are very quick-witted, 
fast communicators and always looking for new ways to express themselves and do research and all of that. Again, that's my ascendant. So um, the talkative thing, you guys already know that because you're listening to a podcast that's probably well over an hour now. Um, <laughs> so Cancer is our next one, June 21st to July 22nd. That's symbolized by the crab. Okay. The archetype is the nurturer. This is a cardinal water sign. The ruler is the moon. So it's the ruler of our emotions. So the crab is very nurturing and emotional. And a lot of people are like, crab, emotional? Well, the thing is that they're very protective. They're highly in touch with their emotions. And that gives them like vulnerability. And so they can be prone to moodiness. They can be prone to people around them. They have a very strong sense of home. And you got to think of like the way the crab shell is so hard. They keep all of that in there, but they're very warm. They're very caring. They love to show love, especially through like cooking and nurturing and all of that stuff. So they're kind of, you know, ruled by the hearth and the home and they're really protective and intuitive. They can get really into their routines and obviously that shell shows you they're kind of like putting people out, okay? So uh, cancer is associated with a crab that Hera sent to fight Heracles or Hercules. Hera was Zeus's wife and hated Hercules, Heracles, because Zeus had an affair with Alcmene. Alcmene. So I, I don't know how to pronounce her name, but this is the thing. All of these hero stories where you have you know, this hero going to accomplish something, it's usually because Zeus cheated on his wife and Hera got pissed off and like, I'm going to curse that child, you know? So Hera cast the spell of madness onto Heracles and caused him to kill his own children. So as penance for that, Heracles is sent to complete 12 labors, okay? And one of his tasks was to slay the Hydra. And the crab was sent by Hera to help the Hydra in the battle against Heracles. But he definitely killed the crab very easily. And so Hera memorialized the crab's effort by making it into a constellation. Okay, so that's that story for Cancer. Cancer suns are actually ruled by the moon. So, you know, Cancers are emotional. They're emotionally mature. They're intuitive, sensitive, artistic, and they're guided by tender, loving, and protective hearts, okay? Their moon, when you have a cancer moon, it's no limits, no restraints. You know, they're very sweet, emotionally aware, responsible, and cancer ascendants tend to wear their hearts on their sleeve, and they care very much for the ones they love, and they aren't afraid to show it. They're the kind of people that are like, I love you, man. You know, they tell you they love you. They don't want a day to go by where you don't know that. Okay, so next we're going to Leo, July 23rd to August 22nd. The symbol is the lion. The archetype is the creative person. They are a fixed fire sign. Sun is their ruler, okay? So they're ruled by the center of our solar system. And just so you know, Leo loves to be the center of everything. <laughs> they love the limelight. They're very much uh, bright, loud, great performers. They are... I mean, one of the things that most people notice or, or say about Leo is that they're self-centered. But the truth is they get a lot of joy from performance, from spreading stories, from, from performing, from entertaining others. They want to bring joy to people. So they're very confident. They're very extravagant. They're loyal. They're ambitious. And, you know, because they're a fixed fire, they're pretty sure they're always right in the center of attention. They're very self-assured. So the next, you know, the story with the Leo, with the lion, is Heracles fighting the Nemean lion. So we just heard about Hera and the 12 labors. Well, you know, or I should say Heracles and Hera and 12 labors. Well, Her Hercules, Heracles, um, the constell constellation of Leo is associated with the mythical lion of Nemea. So when Heracles was tasked with killing um, Nemea, that was the first of his 12 tasks, he actually strangled the lion. And so after his death, he removed the skin and turned it into armor that he wore. 
And Zeus rewarded the lion by giving him a constellation. Okay, so you've got Heracles coming up a few times or Hercules coming up a few times. Now, if you have a Leo son, they're all about will and character and creativity and ego and playfulness, and they're very bold. Their moon is really generous. So if you have a Leo moon, that's a very generous placement. Their act of love is that they're always like showing their emotions to the people they care about. To the other people, they don't give a crap. Okay, uh, Leo ascendants really are uh, radiant and charming and positive and they're performers. They don't really suffer like anybody who's going to bring them down. They don't have time for it. They won't indulge you. You know, they're very friendly and outgoing and extroverted. So they exude confidence and strength. So let's talk about Virgo. They're, they're August 23rd to September 22nd. Their symbol is the maiden. The archetype is the healer or the analyst, whatever you want to do. They're the mutable earth sign. So their ruler is Mercury, the god of communication. All right, so one of the things about Virgo that is true of every Virgo I've met is they analyze the crap out of everything, okay? Okay. They're very detailed oriented. They are the perfectionists of the Zodiac. Okay. They're very practical and grounded and sensible, but that mutable part gives them a little bit of anxiety. They can really see all the possibilities of what could go wrong because they're grounded in, you know, uh, hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. You know what I mean? So they are often seen as like the ones that you would want on a team to be like your editor, your, you know, the one that's criticizing, you know, every possibility. And I don't mean that in a bad way. They tend to just be able to see all the possibilities. We often say they're the, they're anxious, you know, they're the anxiety of the Zodiac, you know, they're the ones who can see everything that can go wrong. You know, they have a keen eye. Their, their judgment is very good. They're very discerning. And in their meticulousness. They can get judgmental. They can get single-minded. They can be overbearing. They can kind of be naggy in that. Okay. But it's one of the things that they're trying to make everything healed, like healing. They're the healers, right? So it's really interesting to kind of work with this because when you think about the symbol, the symbol is the maiden or the virgin, right? And it's ruled by the god Mercury, you know, because of this, Virgo has been associated with like tons of the virgin goddesses like Artemis. OK, so in Greek mythology, the constellation is represented by the goddess Astraea. OK, Virgo is, um, you know, about this discerning, thoughtful, spiritual energy. And so Astraea helped her father be the bearer of lightning during the war between the Titans and the gods. Okay. So her father was a Titan. And so because of that, Zeus respected her loyalty, even though she knew that he knew they were going to win, lose, you know, the Titans were going to lose. Is that right? No, I think I said that wrong. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, Zeus respected her loyalty and decided to raise her up into heavens and place her in the stars, creating the constellation Virgo. Okay, so sun, Virgo's sons are governed by Mercury. So they're thinkers. They process information with diligence and use facts to solve their problems. Okay, they're not very, like, they, they're very logical thinkers. And so that can be, you know, Virgos sometimes are like, um, that's not what you said, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, they're not great at metaphors, I should say. So Virgo moons use their calm nature and they get clarity on matters. So they filter things through logic a lot. They're very kind. They're very reasonable. They're very loving. Okay. Virgo ascendants are the fact finders. They are the the checkers of the zodiac they're fair-minded they're logical again they're like constantly trying to make sure that it's all going to be going according to plan they like plans they really like plans okay libra is september 23rd to october 22nd 
Their symbol is the scales. They're the diplomat. Some people call their archetype the lover. You know, they would be represented by the sixth uh, trump in the, the tarot. So they're cardinal air signs. And they're ruled by Venus, too. So Taurus and Libra are both ruled by Venus. So Venus is, or sorry, Libra is very concerned with relationships, relationships with other people. They're ruled by this balance idea. And Venus, the planet of romance, is really strong in Libra. Whereas in Taurus, it's more about the beauty way. This is more about the partnership way. So they're always looking for balance, peace, and harmony. So Libras aren't the kind of people that are going to take a really strong side. So they bridge gaps between people. They really don't want to offend people. They don't want to make extreme decisions. They go along with other people a lot, which often reflects on them as like, I didn't really want this, but I don't really know what I want, you know. So they're part of a whole and they see themselves that way. And in some ways, you can see the first six of the zodiac signs being associated with the self, the next six being associated with outer concerns. Okay, and this one is relationship. They really do have a strong sense of fairness and justice, and they want to be the mediator. They are indecisive at times, maybe self-pitying, but they are like idealistic and imaginative. They are going for harmony, harmony, harmony. So like Virgo, Libra is also associated with the goddess Destrea. So when Zeus raised Destrea to the sky and placed her among the stars, the scale of justice she carried became the constellation of Libra. Okay. So when you have a Libra sun, uh, you're ruled by more of the airy part of Venus. So they're artistic, they can be critical, they're very stylish, they're definitely the most beautiful of the zodiac signs, right? They're always considered that. Um, but the moon in Libra makes for really relationship-focused people. They base their, their decisions upon how they're viewed by others. Whereas they're rising, they are looking for balance in life, okay? They prefer things to just be civil, even killed. They don't want to rock the boat, okay? Libra risings. Scorpios, <laughs> October 23rd to November 21st. Their symbol is the scorpion. Their archetype is the alchemist. They are a fixed water sign. I know what you're thinking. How does water get fixed? Ice, ice, baby. <laughs> um, they're ruled by the god of the underworld. So they are ruled by Pluto or Hades. They are definitely the most mysterious, the deepest of the zodiac. They're very intense. They're very magnetic but they're not afraid of the dark and they never shy away from like talking about death or talking about like really difficult things. And they often will be like all about transformations. They, they really want people to transform. So their symbols, the scorpion, can also be, you know, a snake or a phoenix, you know, things, anything that's transformational. They are very in touch with their intuition, their subconscious. They're very, very good judges of character. Emotions, they are very into the mystical side of life. They want that mystery there. Okay, they're not into like everybody putting all their stuff out there. They tend to like really be able to perceive other people and want other people to talk about themselves, but they keep themselves hidden. And they're very prone to secrecy. They keep things to themselves. They're determined they're ambitious, they're obsessive. Remember, they're a fixed water sign, which in and of itself is a, you know, a paradox. So their, you know, idea, this destruction and rebirth, destruction and rebirth, they, they think of it like that because the Scorpio constellation was ruled by Mars and by Pluto. So a lot of people think of Scorpio as being a fire sign, even though they're a water sign. But, you know, Pluto gives them an intensity to walk in the shadows. And honestly, we love Scorpio for that. The origin of the constellation comes from the Greek legend of Orion. So Orion was a hunter who declared that he would kill all of the animals on Earth. And Artemis, the god of the hunt, sent a scorpion to kill him in response to that threat. And so the scorpion chased Orion until it finally got him and, and killed him. And the gods raised Orion and the scorpion to the heavens and placed them on the opposite ends of the celestial sky. And this positioning was 
intentional because when the constellation Scorpio rises over the horizon, the constellation Orion hides, fleeing from the animal that caused this death. Okay, so it's like they're yin-yang, sort of. So Scorpio suns um, are known to be really intense. They're known to be very mysterious. They are ruled by Mars and Pluto. So I think like, you know, when people ask me like, oh, I thought Scorpio was a fire. Well, I think they're the fieriest of the water signs. You can definitely say that. But they're always changing and transforming. And I think like, you know, when things like water freezes and gets really, really cold and then it goes so much further that actually burns you when it touches you, you can think of it that way. They're that kind of um, closed off in some ways. You know, that's the, f the fixed part of their sign. So the Scorpio moons are known to be a little brooding, but they're very passionate. And once you win them over, they're totally loyal and unconditional in their love. Whereas rising Scorpios are prone to like sexuality. Okay. And sex is part of Scorpio's, you know, thing. They really turn heads. They ooze kind of sexuality and magnetism and dy dynamic energy. They're not really afraid of putting all that out there. It's funny because I have a lot of friends who are like, I don't like Scorpios, whatever. I think Capricorn's great with Scorpio. You know, we really do understand each other. There's a kind of walking in the shadows part that can be really helpful, you know. So, um, but... I'm, I mean, I'm married to a Scorpio and I've been in relationships with Scorpios and it's challenging, you know, the, the quietness, the closed offness is like, you really have to melt. So let's talk about Sagittarius, November 22nd to December 21st. The symbol is the archer. Okay. And the archetype here is the philosopher. So they're a mutable fire sign. Fire's already mutable. So that works really well for them. They are ruled by Jupiter, the planet of fortune. So Sagittarius's are really optimistic. They're expansive. They're, they're the travelers. You know, they're the ones that want to like explore far and wide. And um, they want to actually, you know, deep dive into their psyche. They're very comfortable discussing matters of philosophy and spirituality, science, all these really big um, themes, you know. They love to learn. They can be really sarcastic and funny. They're very truth-seeking, and they, they aren't afraid to just say the truth, even if it's going to hurt your feelings, and that's probably because they just don't quite have that um, wateriness at all, but they are always, like, in that sunny, positive, good vibes energy, um, so they have a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement. They're spontaneous. They love freedom. They're not, they're, they are like the ones that really go for things like polyamory and things like that. Like they're, they really need freedom. You know, they, they like to talk to people, but it's has to be a deep conversation, you know? So they are really, you know, representative of higher consciousness, the transformation that happens when we do self-awareness work. So because Sagittarius is a mutable fire, they're adventurous, they're positive, they're fiery, they're fun. The constellation is associated with the centaur Chiron. Okay, so Chiron is the, the wounded healer, intelligent, wise, good-natured. Um, and, you know, centaurs weren't really like that. They were thought to be really animal-like, sexual, and, you know, all of that stuff. But um, Chiron was very different. He lived in a cave on Mount Pelion in Thessaly, and he was an educator and tutor, and he was the one that was sent the heroes, okay? And all the heroes in Greek mythology are pretty much half human, half God, okay? So Achilles, Asclepius, Jason, he was a healer, okay? Acteon, Aristio. So he taught them all. And then by the arrow that he was teaching, um, I think it was Achilles, but I'm not sure. Um, he got shot in his heel, and he never could heal himself because he had a poison in there. So he is represented often by the archer's arrow. So it has this idea of like being focused, right? Focused energy. And yet it also represents the wound 
you know, the wound that Chiron carries around and cannot, he can heal everyone else but himself, you know. So that's that, you know, search for truth. And Chiron never stops searching for he, uh, healing for himself. So a Sagittarius sun is, you know, governed by Jupiter. So it's very free-spirited, globe-trotting, philosophical, um, definitely has wild streak. The moon in Sagittarius is very lucky. It's said to bring like a lot of abundance and adventure and all that. You know, it can be defensive, but it's also um, exciting. So rising Sagittariuses are optimistic. They're full of energy. They're just very confident and they're really fun to be around. They're like very um, optimistic and happy. Now Capricorns are December 22nd to January 19th. They are the mountain goat or the sea goat, which I know sounds funny, but um, their archetype is the leader. And um, they are cardinal earth sign. They are ruled by Saturn, the planet of rules and austerity. So um, the mountain goat is one that climbs and is very dexter dexterous, dexter they have a lot of dexterity. Um, they're hardworking, they're determined, motivated, practical, reliable, ambitious. They don't care how long it takes them to get to the top of the mountain. They will get there. Okay, so Capricorns are associated with, you know, being leaders and being bosses. And they are good at looking at the long game. So they're not playing for, like, immediate gratification. Um, they're often very mature and wise, and they are very resilient and persistent and realistic and disciplined. Their sense of humor is very dry and they do place an importance on social status and money and work ethic. Okay. They're leaders and loyal, but they are prone to stubbornness, even though they're a cardinal sign because they're leaders because they value tradition. And often Capricorns have a very hidden like spiritual side. So, you know, the Capricorn myth associated with Saturn is around Zeus's childhood. So Capricorn is related to the myth of Almathea. So she was a woman who took the form of a goat and Almathea raised the infant Zeus after his mother Rhea hid him in the mountains to protect him from Kronos because Kronos thought he was going to kill him. Now Kronos, if you remember, uh, cut the penis and nuts off of his father and threw it into the sky or the sea or whatever. And when Zeus became an adult, you know, Kronos didn't know that he hadn't eaten Zeus. He didn't know about Zeus. So he fought the Titans in a goatskin armor to honor Almathea, who raised him, you know, as a goat. <laughs> um, so that's why goat became associated with Capricorn and the god Saturn, Okay. So Capricorn's son are very authoritative. They tend to work hard. They are very disciplined. Capricorn moons are very reflective and con contemplative, and they work to build a better foundation, okay, for other people. And the Capricorn ascendants are known for diligence and effort, and um, they kind of work hard for success and prosperity. All right. Uh, Aquarius are January 20th to February 18th. And again, these shift a little bit because um, I know a, a few 21st of January um, Capricorns. Um, so anyway, the symbol is the water bearer. The archetype is the humanitarian and it's ruled by Uranus, the planet of sudden change. It is a fixed air sign. So Aquarius really is its own being altogether. You know, they are weird they're creative they're really innovators they're the innovators of the zodiac they're forward thinking and they often will think of humanity as a whole rather than getting like focused on the emotions of one person so aquarians are the kind of people that won't quite understand why you why they're hurt like they won't understand why you're hurt by them but they will be like totally dedicated to fighting hurt in the world. You know what I mean? So they're very progressive. They're independent. They're idealistic. They're really comfortable on the fringes of society. They have a very unique vision of the world and a vision of themselves. And I have a couple of Aquarian nieces and nephews that just, they really march to their own drum. Okay. They are, you know, 
ruled by Uranus, which is the planet of revolution, okay? So they don't just make change. They, like, want to change the whole system, okay? Now, Aquarius is ruled by two planets, Uranus, the revolutionary, sudden change, and Saturn, the rule maker. So that's why they want to change the whole system. They really forge like the whole, a whole new path. And they're, you know, they're air signs. So it's intellectual. They're very insightful. They're very intuitive. They have that brain thing going on. So the constellation of Aquarius associated with Ganymede, who is considered the most beautiful mortal man. And so Zeus kidnapped Ganymede and took him to Mount Olympus to make him a cupbearer. And so that's how the Ganymede, you know, became Aquarius. So um, Aquarius' sun is ruled by both Saturn and Uranus. So that makes them uniquely qualified to problem solve and look at life. So they're innovative. Whereas moon is, you know, Aquarius moon basically mixes logic and emotion. They're very attuned to their inner lives. Their rising Aquarians are, um, they can speak very well. They understand a number of topics. They use all of their study and knowledge to problem solve and to help other people. So, um, so let's talk about Pisces, the last one, okay? February 19th to March 20th. The symbol here is the fish. The archetype is the dreamer. These are the mutable water signs and mutable water that's what, what water is, okay? So the ruler is Neptune, the planet of illusion. Very important here for understanding Piscean people. Um, it is said that um, this sign is like, because it's the last one, it kind of embodies a lot of everything, you know? So they're very mystical. They tend to be very connected to their dreams in touch with their emotions and intuition and they are often boundaryless. They adapt to people around them. They're very much shifting their identity. They absorb other people's energy unknowingly, and they're prone to like losing themselves in like a dream world. So escapism, sleeping too much, <laughs> using substances, uh, not facing situations. That's kind of all of Piscean things. So um, they are empathetic and they are generous and they're willing to give of themselves. So they're very creative. And in that poetic, painterly way, you know, they're just friendly and kind and sensitive and they're really into the emotions. Now, Pisces symbolizes the division of Aphrodite and Eros in the form of two fish swimming in opposite directions. So Pisces is ruled by both Neptune and Jupiter. And so because they're like this mutable water sign, they're basically the most watery water that ever watered. It, they're very creative. So the Greek mythology here, the monster Typhon descends on Mount Olympus, threatening all the gods and goddesses. They were created by the Titans, obviously. And so all the gods and goddesses, you know, most of them did, fled their homes. But Typhon, when he approached the goddess Aphrodite and her son Eros, who's Venus, or Cupid in Roman mythology, they need to escape. So they split, they make themselves into fish and they tie their tails together so they would still be together. And they swim away to safety and to honor that they were placed in the heavens as two fish swimming in opposite directions, okay? And that's the constellation Pisces. One of the things to remember is that when we think about the mythology, it's just a way to remember like some of the energy here, you know, swimming in two directions, a very mutable quality, right? So a Pisces sun is ruled, you know, obviously Pisces is ruled by Jupiter and Neptune, and that gives the Pisces sun very intuitive, imaginative, sentimental, nostalgic, kind of a dreamy way of being. Whereas Pisces moons are really hyper attuned to the energies and needs of others. The ascendants are really committed to who they are, to their beliefs, to their imagination, to maybe like being an artist would be part of what they would do, you know, be committed to. So those are the signs. Took a long time. Hopefully it didn't bore the crap out of you, but there we go.
So Natalie's third question is, how do you incorporate astrology into your readings and into your life? So I basically know my chart. I, I keep it, you know, pretty close and try to understand how, you know, the astrology that's happening might affect my life. Um, and I do the same thing with my clients. So I often ask them what their sun sign is. If I know them a little better, I might ask what their moon and their rising is. And then I can give them a heads up like, hey, this is a full moon in your rising sign. This is a great time to draw some power in. Uh, I might, um, you know, kind of know uh, what we're looking at. So often like when something's happening, like there's a Mercury in retrograde. I know Mercury is in Capricorn for me. So it's in my eighth house. And when Mercury is in the eighth house, the one that rules death and mental health, then as a Capricorn, I have to make sure that I mean what I say and say what I mean and have a very stable, serious, practical way of thinking most of the time. So I have to make sure that I'm doing research and gathering information that I'm checking and double checking. So I'm more prone to research death, for example, than feel anxiety about it, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, those who have uh, this placement in particular, like Mercury and Capricorn, um, they tend to have a higher tolerance for stress and distress and trauma. They're not as phased than other people. So I know this, um, and it's funny because, like, these are the kind of people that you ask to be the executor of your will, you know, uh, who manage trusts and deeds and um, they may be morticians or funeral directors or undertakers. And one of the reasons for that is just that comfortability with death. So when Mercury's retrograde, then I might be seeing that my direct style of communication, the way that I'm not afraid of death, could hurt or cause confusion in people. Almost like a sensitivity. They might be more analytical than emotional in the way I communicate. So, you know, astrology can be used for so many things, but when you, when we use it for self-awareness and self-discovery, it can be very useful. An old friend of mine once said like something like, I read horoscopes and when it says something, I think about how I would react if that was true. Like, you're going to get a new job. How would I feel if that were true? And then figure it out from there. But it, this was really fun to talk about astrology and kind of synthesize my thoughts on it. I mean, this is a 37-page research that I did here over, you know, a two-month period. So um, I really, like, appreciated having to talk about all that stuff because I don't, you know, I, I kind of started this podcast going like, I don't really, I'm not an astrologer. And yeah, I know a lot and it's nice to kind of synthesize those things um, and have that on the go. So thank you so much for asking your questions. And if you have a question, please feel free to drop me a line at Angie at the moon and stone dot com. Thanks for listening to Centered with me, Angie Yinkst. If you'd like to send me a question or comment about this show or any shows, you can send them to angie at themoonandstone.com.